Beethoven the myth, Beethoven the legend, but what about Beethoven the man? You see, I asked my friends what they knew about Beethoven and not much could be said. I originally wanted them to take a video saying what they knew and I was gonna put it over the screen here, but they all said they didn't know much. Uh, they knew he was German, they knew he did a lot for music, he wrote some cool stuff, we got Beethoven's fifth, we got Beethoven's ninth, but other than that, they didn't really know too much. And to be fair, I didn't either, and I literally went to school for music. I mean, I knew a few fun facts about him and things like that, but what was his story? How did he become the great musician we all know? Nowadays, it seems like we only know his music was great, he was kind of a grump, and he had crazy hair. And his hair was crazy for multiple reasons, because there was lead in it. You see, he had so much lead that it would kill a modern man today. So much lead that probably caused a little bit of his angerness, but it did not cause his deafness. You see, his deafness, we don't really know what caused it, but lead doesn't do that. But it could explain why he was kind of a jerk. And yeah, did you know he was kind of a jerk? More than kind of a jerk, you'll see. Also, I love this NPR article. It just says Beethoven was a classical and romantic composer, but his body was full of heavy metal. Like lead, you get it, like the genre. So the story of Beethoven doesn't start with Ludwig Beethoven, it starts with Ludwig Beethoven, senior, his grandfather. His grandfather was a great musician, a Kapellmeister, awesome dude, and he had a son, Johann. And he called the son Johann the Sprinter because Johann was slow, intellectually and in a lot of other ways. He was constantly making Ludwig Senior upset with him. He was failing a lot, not doing as well, he wasn't as gifted, as talented. And so Ludwig Sr. wanted to control him as much as possible to shape him into something better. Well, that didn't really work out, and Johan decided to go off and get married without his father's permission. And Johan had kids. The first kid passed away, sadly, but later, Ludwig was born. The one that we know, Beethoven. He was the oldest of three surviving brothers. There is seven total born, but only three survived. We got Ludwig, Casper, and Johan. Yeah, named after his dad. It's really funny, when I was doing research for this, I read a lot of different sources, and when I read it on Wikipedia, it said some things that were just wrong. Johan, Ludwig's dad, was not very talented. It says on Wikipedia he was, but he was not. He was always having issues, couldn't provide for his family very well, and just all around kind of a loser. Ludwig, though, he had a lot of talent, at a little age. You see, good old Louis boy, Louis, he was amazing at violin and piano, and there was another amazing pianist nearby, good old Mozart, and he was shocking the world because he was young and doing so many things. So what Johann actually did was decide, ha, let's take this Ludwig and make him a really, really good pianist and also lie about his age. You see, his dad would always uh, fake the age, saying he was younger than he actually was, whether or not people believed him, we don't really know, but we know that Johann lied about it. Beethoven really enjoyed music a lot, to the point where he started experimenting with some improvisation, which Johann did not like. Johann told him to stick to the scales, stick to the things that are already written, but Ludwig wanted to keep on going further. Eventually, Johann lightened up, let him do his thing, and realized this guy can write. So, shipped him off to Vienna to work with Haydn and learn how to write music. 1795 was Ludwig's first big year. His Opus 1 trios for violin, piano, and cello were premiered, and they did very well. Beethoven wrote two more trios, and the third one was advised by Haydn not to be published, thinking the long and dramatic piece wouldn't fare well with the general audiences. This is a big thing we'll have coming up over and over. But Beethoven didn't take it that way. He thought, Haydn was jealous because it was better than what Haydn was writing. So this pushed Beethoven to go ahead and publish it and do even more with music. He kept on writing for small ensembles, strings, piano, stuff like that, and he decided it's time. Let's tackle this symphony. Now, his early years were known as the Viennese years because, I mean, he was in Vienna, but also the style. It's very close to classical, but I beg to differ, and I'll, sh I'll show you why. His first symphony was Symphony in C Major, or was it in C major? It opens with a C7 chord. For those music theory nerds, you'll know that means that we're actually in F major. But whoa, what's going on? Are we in A major? See, total ambiguity was pretty much born with Beethoven. Before that, it wasn't very common for us to not know what key we're in. But he decided to do this chord progression that's modern even to today's standards. 
There's a lot of references to classical material inside the symphony, but the harmony underneath is the same as the opening chords. You see why he did that? He's laying the foundation and he threw the melody on top of it. I would definitely say scholars are incorrect by calling this piece classical. It's clearly romantic. There's quite a bit of romanticism inside there, a lot of drama, and a lot of new and cool things that are very Beethoven. The year after is when deafness started, and he wanted to keep it a secret. He started to become a bit of a recluse because of that, avoiding people, and one of his ears, I believe it was his left one, could only hear low frequencies. That's, that's rough. He grew into a little bit of depression because of that, uh, eventually writing this testament that was basically saying, I'm mad, I'm upset with this world. The testament is called the Highland Gestalt Testament. I'm mad at myself. Why am I going deaf? I need to be reborn. And he was reborn. He reinvented himself as this heroic icon. His reinvention was ultimately a way to turn away from his depression. And he modeled his newfound self after Napoleon Bonaparte, who at the time wasn't known as a tyrant, but rather a hero of revolution. He loved Napoleon so much that he originally titled his symphony number no. three, Bonaparte, because the symphony was meant to be a heroic statement. Yet when Napoleon's tyranny was found out, Beethoven ripped the title page off and renaming it after himself. Symphony Eroica, the heroic symphony. You see, Beethoven liked Napoleon at first because he represented the opposition. Beethoven hated the man. So to see somebody sticking it to the man become the man, he was pissed. But still, Beethoven kept on writing with this new heroic identity, just without Bonaparte in mind. The symphony was very revolutionary for its time. It was so dramatic. One thing I remember from music history was this era being the era of storm and stress in music. It was not usual for symphonies to be this bombastic, over the top, and full of emotion. Before then, music was just music. It was there, it had no purpose other than being music. But now, there's story, there's emotion, there's action behind everything. The heroic symphony was one of the most pivotal pieces in Western music. Without it, programmatic music of this sort would be written later by some other composer and shifting the entire timeline of music history as we know it. And just as Haydn worried with that other piece, this piece was not generally favored by many audiences. They were confused by it. They didn't know how to feel about all the amazing, wild, and bombastic changes. But luckily, as Beethoven wrote his next works, Symphony 4, 5, and 6, and his opera Fidelio, people started warming up to him. Also, he was lucky that the elites in Vienna knew a genius when they saw a genius. They were smart people. So they decided to declare Beethoven's music good. And this helped out for a lot of people because they listened to the elites. From what I found in my research, these were the best years of his life. His middle stage, his heroic invention. After Beethoven died, it was discovered that he left a note. The note is dated July 6th, but without a year. It talks about how he loved a woman and the woman loved him back, which is rare because Beethoven was horrible with the women. He was often into younger, more wealthy women that were out of his reach, and Beethoven being the shaggy guy, he was really only attractive because of his music. Outside of that, he was angry, he was a recluse, he didn't take very good care of himself, so women were not generally attracted to him. But we later found out that the recipient of this note was somebody named Antony. Antony had a husband, but it was a marriage that didn't have a lot of love inside of it. She had to move to Frankfurt with her husband, but eventually came back after her father died, living in his estate for a few years. And she was lonely there. According to some sources, she became a little bit cuckoo and only saw Beethoven, nobody else. Just as the testament written up there was a shifting point in his self-image to heroicism, his note addressed to this immortal beloved was his second shifting point. You see, Beethoven had to break things off. I mean, she was married, he was not a horrible person yet. So he finished things and then he became depressed and lonely. From there, Beethoven didn't see much happiness outside of his music. His music though was a stark contrast to his life at that point. It was very rhythmic, very upbeat, very enlightening. Listen to a symphony number no. seven, the dance symphony. Oh my goodness, the rhythm in those, it's pretty awesome. Also, one of the movements inside there is about the frustration of a metronome. You literally hear the ensemble grab the metronome, shake it, and throw it around. Like we've all probably want to do with a metronome once or twice. So this note marked a reinvention, but not a good reinvention. It was known that he would frequent bars and not drink, but just sit there menacingly with a grimace on his face, not talking to anybody. 
He started to become a bit of a psychopath during these years. We can only assume that this was a big moment of reflection for him, especially with his family. Around this time, he started really admiring his grandfather, Ludwig van Beethoven Sr., seeing him as some amazing figure that really enlightened Beethoven himself. And he really started to despise his father, Johann, which is very understandable. I mean, Beethoven pretty much raised his brothers and financially supplied his mother and his father. His father was a drunk. He didn't do very much with his life at all. He was a loser. He didn't make it very far in music. And eventually he succumbed to his drinking illness. Beethoven, because he was not very good with women, was mad at his brothers because they were good with women and had wives. Beethoven was usually nice to his younger brother Casper, but always thought of his youngest brother, Johann, to be an idiot. Johann spent a lot of his life trying to impress his older brother, but to no avail. When Johann finally had his own land and a house, he wrote a letter about his success and addressed it as, From your brother, Johann, landowner. To which Ludwig responds, From your brother, Ludwig, brain owner. When Beethoven's brother Casper died in 1815, Beethoven saw this as a moment to save his now fatherless nephew, Karl. Which is sad, because in Casper's will, he said to keep his child with his wife, not Beethoven. Beethoven didn't care, and he went to court and got Karl. Because he was a celebrity, the court listened to him rather than the mother. He stole Karl away at the young age of nine. This understandably caused a lot of family drama. The issues got worse. He believed that he was being followed by spies sent from Karl's mom, Johanna. He also thought that Johanna killed his brother, confirming Beethoven's hero complex. Eventually, he thought himself to be the real father of Karl, which adds so many questions I can't even fathom of it. Oddly, he both hated and was attracted to Johanna, growing his psychotic state even more. This section was really the worst for Beethoven. Johanna kept on fighting to get her child back, and she would frequent his school. And one day, Carl ran away and went back to his mother. But in court, Beethoven tried to steal him back. Now one of the reasons he was able to take Carl away in the first place is that Beethoven lied. Well, he thought he was telling the truth, but he was just crazy. You see, Beethoven had the psychotic notion that he was the illegitimate child of Frederick the Great, making him royalty. It was found out that he was not. And Carl finally got back to Johanna, which is what I would say if the world were a good place, but instead the imperial family sided with Beethoven and gave him back Carl. Johanna gave up, remarried, and had a new child named after Ludwig himself, Ludovica. Why the name? The speculation says it's a method of taking back what in her eyes was so bad, the name Ludwig, giving her control to put the entire situation in a good place. Beethoven's final years of writing were interesting. He started writing music that was even more dramatic, even more upbeat, more contrast. It's a very stark difference as to what was going on in his life. The highs in his music were extremely high and the lows were extremely low, but for the most part, Beethoven was depressed and lonely. He wrote his final symphony, which he knew was going to be his last one, and made it a big statement for the world. The melody, the Ode to Joy, is simple, singable, yet very powerful. He knew it was going to be known for years to come. The piece laid the groundwork for inspiration that's still felt today, 200 years later. After writing that, he unknowingly only had less than three years left to live. And these were very dark years. His relationship with his friends and family were falling apart, as well as with his nephew Carl. In fact, Beethoven started mimicking his grandfather, being very controlling and not letting Carl get with any women. Eventually, Beethoven hired a spy, I know, kind of ironic, to follow Carl around, and Carl and Beethoven would often fight over this, eventually it culminated in Carl deciding to end everything. Carl bought two weapons, climbed to the top of a mountain, stuck a barrel to his head, and pulled the lever. Luckily, he didn't angle the barrel correct, so only a small chunk ended up in his scalp, and he stayed alive. That's when the police finally separated Carl from Beethoven, and Beethoven's final months were difficult. Constant illness, constant pain, cramping, no appetite, and heavy loneliness. He knew the end was coming. It was a slow and painful death. His frail body slowly visited his sister-in-laws and brother, reconciling their issues and making amends. On March 26, 1827, Beethoven laid on his deathbed with only Johanna van Beethoven by his side. A heavy storm raged outside with one crack of thunder, causing Beethoven to raise his fist to the heavens, clenching it tightly, only for it to fall as his last heartbeat sounded. Tens of thousands went to his funeral, which had a great oration by Franz Grillparzer. You see, 
Beethoven's legacy is huge, but it's been shrouded. It's been shrouded by his music, his mythology. He cast a huge shadow that made a lot of composers afraid that they will never write as good as him. He was amazing at what he did. People that were close to him made sure to write biographies about him that would show him only in light. Yet, when we get the whole story about Beethoven, we start learning that there's a lot of issues under the surface. Was it caused by the lead in his hair? Maybe, we don't really know for sure. It's undoubtable that his music was great, but also, his life was interesting. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you haven't seen my video about Hector Berlioz or how I got a right for DCI, check out the videos. If you liked the video, drop a like. Anyways, I'll see you in the next video.